first contributor. <clears throat> well, I'll jump right into it. Um, I've written down a few notes trying to um, contribute to the questions that Adam just sketched and uh, um, hopefully ending on, on five notes that I think could be uh, leading us or help us to formulate how we enter a, a phase where we build structure rather than just being paralyzed by what we witness every day. Well, didn't we think that creating alter alternate realities was the privilege of artists? Well, we were wrong. The lunatics have taken over the asylum. A science fiction writer, William Gibson, recently explained the year 2016 brought about things in 12 months he had imagined to happen over the course of the next 20 years. These days at the White House, Mango Mussolini in a bathrobe watching cable news unleash his unhinged series of Twitter insults, while the two Steves, Bannon and Miller, write up another mean-spirited and incompetent executive order. I mean, by the day. Meanwhile, in Downing Street, London, I can picture Theresa May clicking her leopard high heels together like Dorothy in Wizard of Oz, still psyched up by the Parliament votes in favor of hard Brexit from a few weeks ago supported by a lemming Labour Party hell-bent on playing to the supposed leanings of their constituencies against any better knowledge, including all the things that have happened since the pro-Brexit poll last June. And of course, other countries around the world, from the Philippines to Brazil, are also experiencing an increasing onslaught of propaganda and outright suppression. Turkey, under Erdogan, since the supposed coup attempt last July, has dramatically moved towards an outright dictatorship with thousands imprisoned on cooked up conspiracy and terrorism charges. As any already fleeting ideals of an open society are replaced with isolationism, chauvinism, and xenophobia, the illusion that anything but illusion will be declared the official government story is terminally shattered. Well, we could have known better, I guess. Many of us had forgotten or declared old-fashioned what writers such as Bert Brecht, Hannah Arendt, and George Orwell had described more than half a century back. That in a society under increasingly autocratic totalitarian rule, it is the privilege of those in power to not only lie about reality, but define, shape, also reality itself. As artists find themselves under pressure to live up to the challenge of nationalist populism, there also occurs the surprising revival of outmoded seeming forms. Just as historic texts by Hannah Arendt and others are circulated again to shock readers sensing eerie topicality, so are old poems and monuments. Well, who would have thought only a few months back that they would see so many cartoon renditions of the Statue of Liberty, we see her beacon light gone out or her head chopped off. Suddenly, the figure that had seemed to have become a travesty printed on tourist mugs and t-shirts, a joke in the face of long-standing US realities, such as the world's highest incarceration rate, appears in new light. A few weeks ago, activists in New York attached a banner to Lady Liberty reading, Refugees Welcome. Only a few months back, that would have felt like attaching a banner to the Eiffel Tower saying, Her Paris. <laughs> After all, Emma Lazarus, in her famous 1883 sonnet, already had declared the statue in capital letters, the, mothers, the mother of exiles, and put words in her mouth that are a forceful counterspell to any anti-immigration xenophobia. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched reviews of your teeming shore. But as statue and poem are revived in a moment of peril, fabricators of images, shapes, and scenarios will have to keep looking for new approaches. The discussion so far, it seems to me, has been too much concerned with following an age-old script. It is the script that pits the universally abstract or intimately figurative work on the one hand against the overtly political one on the other. 
One party advocates for the former, arguing that precisely at times of repression, the experience of the melancholic violence solo or the carefully crafted sculpture are safeguards of civility and sanity. Another party fiercely opposes that view, condemning, to quote Bert Brecht from 1935, painters covering the walls of sinking ships with still lives. And then there are those that think the real point is to resist by keeping the full spectrum of artistic utterances alive, countering the urge to play off one kind of artistic sensibility against the other, honoring, honoring del delicately intimate expression as the essentially necessary complement to agitprop action. I tend to think so too, but also believe that's not enough. While artists join efforts of opposition and civil disobedience, just like citizens from all other walks of life, it has become harder than ever to devote time and attention to artists crafting footnotes to art history or replicating tried and tested art market fodder. How can artists still think with their lazy hoaxes or mildly funny mockumentaries that they are subversives trolling truth and reality when the biggest troll sits in the White House? That said, precisely because trolling has become the dominant formula for political success around the globe, spurned on by racist armies of haters and meme replicators, what seems needed are effective strategies of smart counter-trolling. When Grand Fury, the art division of ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, in 1988 hijacked George Bush Sr.'s populist campaign line, Read My Lips, promising to not introduce new taxes, and linked it on posters and stickers plastered across cities with images of kissing homosexual couples, they were effectively trolling the man who was soon to be in power. There are many examples of promising strategies of smart counter-trolling, both online and on the street, both in the courtrooms and in newsrooms. What we need are not just sound arguments, but also ways to snappily convey them. What we need are strategies to disrupt the disruptors, to counter the thinly veiled right-wing propaganda by insistent, reasonable questioning, trolling them into having to justify the illogical nature of their official claims wherever they make them. Trump and the likes can evade that direct questioning. Their underlings and followers can't. The AFD in Germany has already been set back substantially by a healthy movement against them. For months and years to come, we should pool these kinds of stri strategies of counterintelligence to fire each other up with surprising ideas wrenched from very real feelings of depression, fury, and hope. But in order to do so, we do need to reinvent the we do not need to reinvent the wheel. I, su I suggest we follow the examples of groups like ACT UP, who pioneered new forms of protest, not only in public space, but also in the media. Art-related groups who have gathered experience with ways of efficient organizing and circumventing as good as possible the usual self-destructive infighting so typical for the left. Briefly, that, and that's my closing five points, we can take away five points we can take away from these pioneering forerunners. Point one. Well, let's meet regularly, informally, like we do here now. Act Up New York always met on Mondays. Facebook 4.0 is actually direct eye contact, talking to each other in physical space. <laughs> Second point, let's make sure we include the most diverse group of people possible, not only in terms of ethnicity and gender or sexual orientation, but also in terms of age and class. Again, learn from ACT UP. Let's not get bogged down in sectarianism. Let's not be holier than though. Regarding age for them, it really meant to learn from older activists who've organized before, who've had ex experiences of repression before in the 60s and 70s. And regarding class, it meant for them that homeless street kids become part of the movement just as did a number of Wall Street bankers. We should be open to get wealthy people on board if A, they clearly are willing to work towards the idea of social and economic justice, and B, are willing to dedicate a substantial part of their wealth to the current fight against national, nationalist populism. Third point, <clears throat> my mouth is running dry. <laughs> let's form affinity groups in which different, and I think this is a really important point, let's form affinity groups in which different kinds of knowledge, skills, and passions can flourish without hindering each other all the time. 
One group could focus on social media analysis and action, another on traditional investigative journalism, yet another one on creating images and slogans, yet another one would concentrate on legal matters, just to give a few examples. Fourth point, let's allow ourselves to be inventive, snappy, funny. When it comes to aesthetics and strategies of persuasion, recent protests in the wake of the arrest of the Turkish-German journalist Deniz Yücel by Turkish authorities are a very good example, I think. Instead of the usual marching protest, supporters organized many car motorcades around the country, which therefore got major coverage in the media that probably otherwise wouldn't have happened. The point was to recharge a cliched notion that Turkish people somehow like to do motorcades in Hong and fill it with new progressive meaning. They're actually doing one in Hamburg uh, on the occasion of a Turkish uh, minister uh, doing a propaganda speech next weekend, I think. Fifth and final point. <clears throat> well, that's another lesson from ACT UP. Let's allow ourselves to have fun. After those Monday meetings, partying was in order at ACT UP. ACT UP's political actions, because of their wit and aesthetic rigor, were often pleasure in and of themselves, even if that simply involved the pleasure of expressing your anger. More importantly, your political judgment will be clouded by distress and repression, or worse, and your group structure will fall apart if you don't allow the whole thing to be induced with sensual pleasure and comic relief, with eating and drinking and dancing together and making jokes. To quote a famous public enemy slogan, party for your right to fight. One last thing, um, I got an email earlier today from Doris Akrab, um, who is uh, an editor at Die Tageszeitung, and a, a close friend of Dennis Ujel, who's imprisoned in a prison outside of Istanbul right now in solitary confinement. Dear Jörg, I'm sorry to let you know that I will have to stay in Istanbul and therefore can make it to your event. I stay because I have to take care of the sister of Dennis as well as for journalistic reasons. I would have loved to contribute, but I hope you understand. Please say hello to everyone and let them know that the case of Dennis Yücel and hundreds of other Turkish journalists makes clear that it's not a tired, empty phrase to say that the powerful feel more threatened by the pen than by the sword. Next time you make a workshop, I'm happy to join. All the best and please excuse Doris Akram. Thank you.